Today, Lord, as we consider your word, we know that Matthew 24 is not an easy chapter because there are so many things that seem conflicting, some things we don't seem to understand, but yet we thank you that the Holy Spirit is the one who opens our eyes and opens our hearts and minds and opens our wills to you so that we will do what is pleasing and acceptable to you. Thank you too for Pastor David preaching the next door. We ask the Lord you continue to be with him, strengthen him, because these past few days he has not been well. But I ask, Lord, that your spirit will come upon him in a mighty way, that your word will go forth with power, conviction, and simplicity, just as it does so here, that your anointing will be upon each and every one of us as we receive your word, that we'll receive it as it is, the word of God, the word of truth, the word of sincerity, the word in which you will transform our lives and make us the men and women, the boys and girls, that you want us to be. Thank you, loving Father. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. You know, Matthew 24 is a very difficult passage, as I've said just now in my prayer. Many people are wondering what is Jesus talking about because he's jumping from one thing to another. Uh, you know, he doesn't seem to be quite consistent. You know, yet it was called the Olivet Discourse because it was given in Mount Olive. And as you know, Mount Olive is also the place in which Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount. And those of you who have been to Israel, you know that Mount Olive is a very interesting place because, you know, the acoustic is so good that even though you stand right up there and you speak, everybody can hear around you because that is a natural acoustic right there. Be the mountains with the you know, grass, as well as the sea right in front of you, okay? So this was preached right in Mount Olives, and Jesus stimulates his disciples with three questions, the three questions that they have. And the question in which he wanted them to know the answers to, but the answers that Jesus gave may not seem to be the answer that you wanted it. Because when Jesus talks about the, you know, the end times, he was referring to the temple. He was talking about the destruction of the temple. Now, the temple is a very majestic building, you know, laid with marbles and, you know, laced with gold. And it was a very precious, one of the ancient wonders of the world. But how would Jesus say that, you know, the temple will be destroyed and what, not one stone will be left on another? It's very hard to imagine that because to a young person walking around the temple or outside the temple, you see it as a very majestic building with big stones, stones as big as 40 feet, you know, uh, that's 40 feet high, 12 feet wide, and 12 feet deep. You know, it's so huge. How can these stones crumble? And that no one stone will be upon another when the destruction comes. Well, Jesus was referring to AD 70 when the Romans under Emperor Titus was going to overrun the city and destroy a million of the Jews and also the temple, bring it right to the ground. And that's what Jesus was referring to. Interestingly, why does Jesus talk about the temple? Because when you look at Revelation chapter 11, verse 1, you know, John was also given a measuring rod. He was asked to measure the length, the breadth, and the height of the temple. Of course, this past few weeks, someone sent me an article or you know, something from Israel that says that they are going to have a subway going to and from the temple. It is like the fulfillment of what the Bible is talking about. Because for 2,000 years, there was no temple, there was no temple worship, but one day the temple will be built. And as I've said before, the temple doesn't need a long time to be built because it's not a very huge, tall skyscraper. It's just a short, maybe two, three-story building. It could be finished within months. Thus, it's not surprising when Jesus talks about the temple because the temple will be rebuilt and temple worship will be reinstated. Now, this passage is hard to understand because Jesus says, this generation, then he talks about the temple, the stones, you know, lying one on, on top of the other. And then on the other hand, he talks about the end times, about how the moon, you know, will, will not give light and the sun will not shine and the stars will fall. The cosmic forces will be causing great upheaval on the face of this earth. Did those things all happen in AD 70? No. You know, when I was studying this chapter, the more I studied, the more excited I was. 
Because I realized what Jesus was talking about. That he was talking about the temple now, and yet there will be a temple at the end times. He's talking about what destruction there will be of Jerusalem in AD 70, where the Jews will be scattered across the nations because Jesus says, you will have to run for your life, but pray. They will not be over the Sabbath. Because, and not only over Sabbath, it will not be over winter. And those who are suckling babies pray that it will not happen during your time. Because as you think about it, for those of us who are a little older, just to walk, you know, when we're older is a little more difficult. But when you walk on slippery roads, you know, when the winter is there and the roads are wet and the path is wet and it's slippery, it's very tough. But how much more for those bearing children? It'll be a tough time. You know, Jesus is talking about a scattering to the nations. But then towards the end, he talks about when you see the fig tree bears leaf, when the shoots are tender and the leaves starts to grow, you know that summer is near because he was predicting the ingathering of the nation of Israel, that Israel will be restored as a nation. Thus, this passage, when you look at that context, it's not so difficult to understand because Jesus is talking about the AD 70 destruction which will happen 40 years after his ascension and then about the end times in which will be one week of Daniel's revelation right in the book of Daniel when he predicted the one week in which in the middle of the week the abomination of desolation the man whom we call the Antichrist will set up an image of himself to be worshipped. That's when the end will come. So, beloved, I look at this passage and I say, wow, you know, wow, I'm so excited, I want to preach this. When will this happen? You know, Jesus answered to them, right, in verse 36. And then what will be the sign of your coming? Jesus answered them in verse 30 to 35. And then what will be the sign of the end of the age? Jesus answered between verses 4 to verse 29. So what was the Lord Jesus talking about? He was referring to the end of times, the end of world history. This is what this chapter is talking about, the end of world history. You know, today people want to know a lot of things. When I was young, my mother always go to the, you know, C. Baylor, you know, the time we call it the Fourth Road, you know, uh, right in uh, North Bridge Road. And I know that every time she brings me there, before she became a Christian and I was a little boy, she'll go to this fortune teller with a little bird in his cage. And then, you know, this man would knock, knock, knock on the, you know, just toss his little uh, cup with all these sticks there and ask the bird to pick one, you know. And then after he'd tell my mother, what would the fortune be? Oh, your son will pass his exam. Oh, your husband will find a new job, you know. And the family will be peaceful and prosperous. A lot of people want to know all this thing about the future. But when you talk about this, that's what people want to know. But they're not interested to know about the end of times, about things of eternity. But thanks be to God, we are Christians and we are concerned not so much about the day-to-day -day mundane things like this. What is the future of my child or my family or my jobs or my whatever you know I have or the, the world? What will the future of the world be? Beloved, this chapter is about the end of times. It's about the end of history. It's about final. You know, it's like that contest where it says final, final answer. You know, it's a final, final, final. There's no other time or space to even move an inch because it will be the last days of days. Beloved, most important thing with regards to this chapter is not about when are the last days. You know, today I, I look at many of us Christians we speculate a lot about the land days. When is it going to happen? I remember t telling you how this man who wrote a book about you know, the Antichrist, about the seven heads and the ten horns, he even said that it will come in our lifetime, 1978. And I tell you, my beloved, I couldn't wait for 1979. You might say, Pastor, you're very sadistic. No, I'm not. I just remember what Jesus said. Of that day, of that hour, no one knows, not even the Son of Man, nor the angels, except God the Father. It's very clear. 
The word of God is very clear. Don't speculate as to what day. And then one day when I was reading this Asia magazine, it also talks about, you know, a, a Korean preacher. You know, he asked people to sell the, the properties, give all the money to the church, and then go up to this mountain, stay there and wait for Jesus because October 29, you know, Jesus will come in that year. I think it was 1991. He said, Jesus will come. No, sorry, 1992. He said, Jesus will come at that time. And so the people who follow him, they actually sold their houses, the properties, gave all the money to him, and then they stayed there and waited for Jesus. Jesus says of that day, of that hour, no one knows, not even the Son of Man, nor the angels, because only the Father knows. So it's not about solving the mystery. But it's about being watchful, it's about being faithful, it's being ready for the coming of Jesus Christ. So today, as I think about this book, actually it's quite easy to, to, to you know, sub, you know, divide this book. First thing I want to talk about the unprecedented turbulence before the coming. Then the unparalleled tribulation, which will be sure and terrible. And then the third will be the unignorable things to come. And lastly, the unknown time regarding Christ's return. You know, as you think about it, as you follow this, actually it's quite easy to understand the book. Because Jesus, right at the beginning, verses 1 to 8, let's read it together. Let's stand as we read, you know, verses 1 to 8. Jesus left the temple and was going away. When his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple, but he answered them, You see all this, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another, they will not be thrown down. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pangs. Thank you. Please be seated. You know, as you think about this, Jesus tells us three things. Firstly, there will be turbulence. You know, recently in our trip back from Korea, 90% of the time, the flight was in turbulence. In fact, all of us on that flight, six and a half hour flight, we never get to drink hot drinks. No coffee, no tea served. Why? Because of turbulence. It was so bad. Turbulence, you know, is something that we don't like, especially for those of us who may have spine problems and other kind of, you know, nerve problems because you're jerking up and down, you know. And the turbulence can last so long that, you know, at one moment I, I just had to go to the toilet. The stewardess says, Mister, can you please return to your seat? I say, I cannot. I already hold for two and a half hours, you know. And I had to go. But, you know, the turbulence caused discomfort. It is something that you don't like because you are deprived of something. Isn't it true? And the things that you want to do, you cannot do. Turbulence. But Jesus says, do not be deceived. Be not deceived. Or be not led astray. If you want all to be under A, you know, be not led astray, be not alarmed, be, not, uh, be aware. You know? That's what you know, preachers like to do all this, right? So it's easy for you to remember. Because Jesus says, false Christ and false prophets will come. False Christ and false prophets will come. Well, who are those false prophets and false Christ? Those who say that Jesus did not come in the flesh. Or maybe the Jesus that was on the cross was Jesus of the flesh, but he is not God. You see, as I said, those untruths or the distorted truth or twisted truth or the subtraction of the truth, the addition to the truth or the pollution of the truth, dilution of the truth, those people will say things that are not true because they will say something about Jesus that is out of sync with the Bible. The Bible makes it very clear that Jesus was born of a virgin. He was the very God of very God who came in the flesh. So 1 John chapter 4, verse 2 and 3 says that anyone who says that Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh, this is the Antichrist, don't follow them. Don't follow. 
And I remember way back in 1978, on the day that this guy, you know, committed suicide, on 18th of November, 1978. His name was Jim Jones, where he led many people under his own organization called the People's Temple, where they, they gave their life, they gave their properties to him, and many of them even gave their wife and their girls or daughters to him, and he was doing all kinds of things, and at the end, he killed all of them one by one. And then he killed himself. First, when the police came, no one was alive. All died. Because he claimed to be Jesus, the Messiah. And people followed him. And I'm sure you remember Sun Myung Moon, who recently came to prominence because of the assassination of Abe Shinzo Abe, the Prime Minister or former Prime Minister of Japan. No, I feel very sad for him because I thought there was a good man. He was the longest serving Prime Minister of Japan. I was hoping that he would come back and be the leader of Japan when he was assassinated. But how was he assassinated? Because of this cult called the Moonies. The Moonies were founded by Sun Myung Moon, and together with his wife, Hak, uh, J, Hak, uh, J, Hak J Han, his wife. They were called the true parents of Earth, because they say that they are Eve and Adam that has come back, and he was the Christ. So people followed him. And I'm sure that many of you who are about my generation remember those mass weddings. Thousands of people gathered together to marry because Sun Myung Moon would conduct this mass wedding for all of them and it was a grand occasion. Newspaper men from all the world are very interested because those were massive events. But they don't know that people were hugely blinded by his teaching. And of course, he died a number of years back. You know, but today his followers are still bringing all kinds of uh, atrocities, like the assassination of Abe, you know, Shinjo Abe. And of course, later on, as I was growing up as a Christian, I heard of this guy called David Koresh. I'm sure some of you have heard of him, but he was quite a good looking guy. You know, he asked people to follow him, go to the wilderness where he had a ranch for them to stay, <coughs> and they would give up their properties their daughters and their wives to him. And at the end, when the police came to surround him and his whole group of people, he set the whole property on fire. 54 adults and 21 children died in that fire. David Koresh. But closer to our times, a few years ago, the Japanese executed one man by the name of Shoku Asahara. He was a Japanese terrorist. And I'm sure we all remember how he, he bring about that sarin, destructive, you know, poison in the subway in Tokyo. And many people were affected because of his cultic beliefs. Beloved, this man, he is the nearest that we can think of in our modern times. But we're not just talking about dead people. We're talking about people today, here and now. Those who do not preach the gospel truth, those who believe in hyper grace, those who believe that, oh, the grace of God will allow you to do anything you want, it's okay. Just know that grace is more than sufficient. Last time we, were, we live under the law, but now we live under grace. The grace of God is more than sufficient for you. You know, Paul the Apostles made it very clear. Does it mean that we have grace, we have the license to do what we want? Paul says, no, by no means. All the more you should live your life according to God's word and according to God's will. Thus, hyper-grace preachers and those who add, subtract, twist, pollute, dilute, present half-truths to suit their own selfish gains. These are happening around the world today. But as Christians, are we alerted to all this? You can only know this when you begin to know the Word. That's why I'm very thankful to God for our church, where we don't just have cell groups, we have CE, Sunday schools, where people come and study the Word, where we dig deep into the Word, we dig deeper into the Word of God, and we want to do what is correct in the eyes of God by studying the common rules and all those books that will help to equip our faith, knowing God, even by Jai Packer. But you know, all these are aids to our pursuit of the truth. But the truth, thy word is truth. 
God's word is truth. And Jesus says, may you sanctify them by your truth. Beloved, we need to be sanctified by the truth of God. Secondly, the Lord Jesus Christ says, do not be alarmed. Be not alarmed. Why? There will be wars and rumors of wars, and many wars have been fought this past century. In fact, it was uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer who says that when God is so to speak, Killed in the 19th century. The 20th century will be the bloodiest century of all. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the mad man, was correct. Because that's what happened to the world. There have been much more, you know, many more wars that were fought in the last century than all the centuries before. Even right now, as you're sitting in this century, there is war going on. Beloved, wars that shouldn't be there. And when you think about what the Bible says about nation will go against nation, kingdom against kingdom, you know, it's so true. What is happening in Ukraine and in uh, Russia, it is so true. Because we're seeing it right with our own eyes. So be aware. Read the newspaper. Listen to the news. Turn into CNA. Turn on to CNN and know what's happening in the world today. But always interpret all these events with the word of God, because herein is the truth. Beloved, unprecedented turbulence. Secondly, unparalleled tribulation will be sheer and terrible. I want to invite you to stand and read verses 9 to 28. It's not a standing, sitting down exercise, but uh, I think it's good right after a while. Let's read from... Uh, <clears throat> Verse 9 to 28. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will rise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. So when you see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is in the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. And let not the one who is in the field not run, turn back to take his clothes. And all us for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days. Pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be safe. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ. Oh, there he is. Do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I've told you beforehand. So if they say to you, look, he's in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is there, the vouchers will gather. Thank you. Please be seated. You know, here the Word of God tells us about the unparalleled tribulation, which will be sheer and terrible. Intense persecution, because lawlessness and lovelessness will prevail. Hatred will be the norm of the day. You know, as you think about it, there's no greater persecution of Christians than now, in our generation, right now and here. Whether you're talking about the modern countries, advanced countries. You know, I have a good friend who lives in a ranch. She wanted everything to be organic. But one day, she, I haven't seen her for years, when she wrote to me and said, can you pray for my daughter? My daughter was in school and she was being persecuted because she's a Christian. Because she's sharing Jesus Christ to her classmates. They not only avoid her, they insult her, and they, you know, ostracize her. That even the professors, you know, will give her grades that shouldn't be given because she was a very good student. She was being persecuted. 
But you know what? She's in a very advanced country. You know, ISIS. You know, ISIS is beheaded people. Killed so many. Some of us say, ah, those are a bit far away from us. Yes, quite true. But you know, recently in my trip to Korea, I remember meeting my friend who was one of the Korean leaders there. And he told me about how the ISIS situation affected the whole of the Korean church, even until today. Remember the case of the pastor who brought his members to Afghanistan and then the Taliban caught them, I mean the ISIS caught them, sorry, and then he was sacrificed because he refused to bend to their demands. Of course, in Korea, the church was split. Some thought he did the right thing. They say he did the right thing, he stood for Jesus, he became a martyr. And so they look upon him as a martyr. But the other half of the Korean church says, no, he's not a martyr, he's a foolish, stupid man. Why is he doing this? He's jeopardizing his life, he's jeopardizing the life of the people who are following him in his tour, in his Christian mission. He was a foolish man. You know, until that time, it has already happened more than 10 years. But people are talking about it. What the ISIS did to those who believe in Jesus Christ. Beloved, the persecution of the Christian church is as real today as it was in those days of the martyrs of the catacombs. So why? Because of the lawlessness, the lovelessness that will prevail. Secondly, the Bible talks about imitations and apostasies. Where there will be false Christ, there will be abomination of desolation. You know, that, that is not the first time it happened. If you look at church history in 168 BC, that was one of those guys who was put up by the Romans, you know. His name was Antichios Epiphanes. He was supposedly one of the great, you know, uh, rulers of the day. But you know what? He went into the temple of God. He put a pig there. And he turned the temple courts into brothels so that the prostitutes will roam and do their trades right in the temple of God. That is what happened. The abomination of desolation. But the day will come in our near future when there will be this man called the Antichrist who will sit right there in the temple and build an image demanding to be worshipped because the image will be that of himself, as recorded in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. You see, false Christs and false prophets, with their persuasions, with their persecutions, and with things that they do that will cause so much problems to the Christian church. Beloved, whatever we are seeing right now, it is not the end yet. It's just the turbulence because the true tribulation will come. Thirdly, impossible survival. That's why unless God shortens those days, it will be impossible for them to even save their skin. That's why I mentioned about the Sabbath, I mentioned about the winter. This is not what I said, it's what the Bible says because during the winter time, it's very difficult to escape. During the Sabbath, they have to observe the law because the law says you cannot go beyond one mile. So if your escape is less than one mile, it's okay, but if it's more than one mile, then you are breaking the Sabbath law. And you will say, "Ha, ah, Pastor, why is the law of God so, you know, strict, so regimented? Well, the law is not regimented. It's the people who are regimented. Jesus says the law was made for the people and not people for the law. So Jesus himself, even when he was hungry, you know, he was eating those those things left over. I tell you, beloved, sometimes we think of things as very straight and narrow. You know, there's no two ways about it. But Jesus says the freedom in the Spirit will help us. Because it's not about the law. It's about the Spirit of the law. Thus, the imitations, the impossible survival, the elect, they will be there. 
You see, that's why today, whether you think about whether it's pre-tribulation or rapture, mid-tribulation or rapture, post-tribulation rapture, or pre-wrath nature or rapture, whatever your view will be, you look at the Bible, it says there will be elect there. They will have to go through the tribulation. Beloved, God's chosen will, you know, not be safe from the trials. But God's chosen will be safe through the trials because God will be with them. Now, the Bible did not say that those are Christians. It says the elect. Because if you believe and I believe that the rapture is pre-tribulation, the Christians has already been raptured out. The Christians are not on the face of this earth. But those who believe during that time, they will go through intense persecution and they'll go through impossible survival. And thirdly, and an ignorable things to come. What are the things to come? Let's stand as we read these few verses, 29 to 35. Let us read. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. And the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. Verse 33. So also, when you see all these things, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Thank you. Please be seated. You know, the Bible talks here about cosmic upheavals. How can the sun not give light and the moon will be darkened? Those seems like impossible, impossibilities. Because the sun is so stable, every morning when you wake up, the sun will rise from the east and set in the west. The sun is what gives light and gives growth and life to mankind. How can the sun not give light? How can the moon be darkened? Until and unless it's talking about volcanic eruptions and earthquakes. Beloved, that is what's happening. You know, right when Mouse and Helen, you know, erupted way back in the 80s. One day I was flying to, you know, uh, Vancouver. You know, that was the Vancouver in in, in uh, <clears throat> Seattle. You know, as the plane was flying, you can see these dark clouds all over. And even when you think about the earth that we live in, when you watch that movie, 2012, you know, when the volcanic eruption erupts, there was this redness, the brightness that is different from the brightness of the sun. Why? Because the volcanic eruptions will darken the sun and the moon, and then the stars will be shaken, you know, like figs coming down from a tree. The cosmic upheavals, those are the sure signs of Christ coming. Beloved, we live in earth where today, even right today, a few weeks ago, I think, there was this asteroid that was passing the earth, and NASA has to send something up there to destroy the asteroid. You see, it is becoming a reality, isn't it? But you say, Pastor, all those things are happening through the centuries of the world. Yes, they have been happening. But you know what is the intensity of the happening? Why? Because they are to the usher in the return of Christ. And that's what I'm talking about. When Christ comes, you will all see Him, whether from the east or the west, because like the sky, in the lightning in the sky, the east will see from the west, the west will see them from the east. And the Bible says it will be so sure. Just like when there's a carcass, the vouchers will be gathered there. It is so sure. The surety is being illustrated by the vouchers. All can see the coming of Jesus in His glory, in His majesty, in all His power. And the Bible says the earth will mourn at His coming. Instead of applauding, 
Instead of welcoming, the earth will be mourning at the coming of Jesus Christ. But a very sheer thing, an unignorable thing to come. Verse 32, the Bible says, as the fig tree, you know, the leaves are tender, you know that summer is near. You know, the fig tree in the entire Old Testament has always referred to the children of Israel. And when the children of Israel comes back, become a nation again, Jerusalem has been the capital of Israel for the last 3,000 years. It has been there since the day of King David. It's only recognized now because Donald Trump says Jerusalem is the capital. And the U.S. moved the embassy to Jerusalem. Beloved, that nation has been a nation all this while. But since AD 70, it was scattered. It's called the diaspora. You know, they're scattered all across Europe, all across America, and there could be more Jewish people living in America than in Israel itself. But Israel will go back to their own land, the promised land that God has promised to Abraham, to which Moses and Joshua you know, were able to be near to it. Moses was near, but Joshua stepped into it because Joshua conquered the promised land in the name of Jehovah. Beloved, the Bible predicts the regathering of Israel, the coming back of Israel. And this happened 14th of May, 1948. Israel became a nation. Of course, everybody wants to say, when will Jesus come? Since 1948, so one generation must be 40 years. So maybe 1988, Jesus will return. But 1988 has passed and Jesus has not returned. Jesus himself says, this generation, you know, will see it. He's talking about the fall of Jerusalem. But in our generation, what is Jesus referring to? I'm sure that everyone alive will see Jesus at his coming. You and I, we will see him at the rapture. But the coming of Jesus to judge the world, only those living at that time, those who are alive. Finally, the unknown time regarding Christ's return. Let's stand as we read 36 to 51. But concerning the day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and one left. Therefore stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would, not, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken in two. Therefore you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his master has set over his household, to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, My master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he does not know, and will be cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. In that day, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Thank you. Please be seated. May God bless the reading, the hearing, and most of all, the joyful obedience to His Holy Word. You know, this part is talking about unknown time. People are speculating, as I said just now at the beginning, but the Bible gives us illustration. The illustration tells us a very simple truth. Jesus will come at a time when you are least expecting Him to come. Just like Noah, in the days of Noah, when Noah built his ark and the eight of them were inside the ark, what happened? People were still eating, drinking, marrying and getting married and they were just enjoying life as before. 
But then the flood came, and the doors to your ark were closed, and there was no more salvation for the people. Thus, the day of Christ's coming will be sudden, swift, but it will be very unexpected. It will be when we are just doing our normal thing. So don't wait till you say, Ha, ah, before Jesus Christ comes, then I believe. Lah. You know, ah, before I die, then I believe in Jesus. I think those are the common excuses that people have in not believing in Jesus. I know of people where I can share the gospel to them until the cows come home and the mosquito goes to bed, and they still say, I believe, but, but what? I say, Uncle, there's only one more step. One more only. Just need to pray and receive Jesus Christ. Oh, never mind. I will wait. Well, you can wait. But will time and tide wait for you? You know, when the end comes, it's the end of history. There will be no more waiting. Thus, in the days of Noah, when they were eating, drinking, getting married, that's when it happens. That's why the Bible says one will be here and one will be left behind, taken and left behind. The woman will be at the meal, one will be taken and one is left behind. So who is the one left behind? Who is the one taken away? Some of us say the one taken away must be the one raptured. The other one will say, no, no, the one who is left behind is the one who will be saved. <coughs> well, I'm not going to speculate. Because when you look at the days of Noah, those who were taken away, you know, were those swept by the flood. But those left behind were those left behind in the ark. You see? So it all depends on how you look at the verse. Is it talking about pre-tribulational rapture or post-tribulational rapture? Because those who are left behind. You see? So whether you are behind or you are taken away, please don't say, wait till before Jesus returns. Please don't say, wait till I'm about to die. You know, I have a friend who is not afraid of anything, but he's afraid of the wrath of God. Because he says that when God's wrath is poured out on me, I sure die. I sure will die. Why? Because his life is not right. He's not living a life that's pleasing and acceptable to God. So, Jesus is coming, but no one knows when. I'm sure by now Jesus will know because he has gone back to be the father after the ascension. But he said at that time and he gave this prediction that no one knows, not even the son of man or the angels, except the father. So beloved, it will be at a time and nobody knows. But the important thing is to be wise and faithful. Now that you know that the time is unknown, let's be wise. Lost, let's not be like those unwise persons that the Bible talks about, who bullies the servant, the stewardship that God has given to him. He abuses them. But the master comes at a time when he leads the speck. So what should you be doing then? I want to suggest to you, whether you are laying bricks, or you're building a wall, or you're painting a tall building, a cathedral, let us be involved in the building of the cathedral that will rise to the sky and glorify God. Because sometimes we look at our church, we say, oh, we are not a very big church, you know, we are quite small. Or some big churches, you know, they will have a lot of resources and time, they can do much more than us. We don't have. But beloved, when you are building God's building, and I'm using the cathedral as an illustration, whether you are laying that brick, or you are building that wall, or you are painting the whole painting, let's be faithfully doing it. Because we will build a cathedral that will rise to the sky and glorify God. So in closing, firstly, let us be girded with truth. You know, the Bible says, put on the full armor of God. Put on the belt of truth, be girded with the truth because the truth is what holds the whole armor together. Your protective gear. Last week I talked about Jesus Christ as our substitute, our saviour and our shield. But today I'm telling you that all these things that the Bible talks about, whether it's the helmet of salvation, whether it is the breastplate of righteousness, is held together, girded with truth. Let us seek the truth. 
Let us study and examine the truth. Let the Berean Christians, they diligently study the word of God and they were not deceived or misled. Secondly, give up speculating, but be watchful and faithful. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. You know, I, I told you before, I think I'm going to say it again. There are some people who are so into Bible prophecy. They want to know every detail, every dot, every comma, every footstop. About what the Bible says about second coming. That you know, we are so engrossed in this whole thing about when is Jesus coming, but what are you doing about Jesus coming? What are you doing when Jesus comes? No, I think that is the most important question, isn't it? That's why my third point I want you to remember is guided by the correct focus. Not on the events, but on the person, on the coming of Jesus Christ. You know, I've told you this story before. You may have forgotten, but it's good to tell you again. <clears throat> when I was young, I grew up with my grandmother. My grandmother was the only grandmother I knew because she lived with us. And I oh know, she rather I lived with her. And later on, when she was older, she lived with us. But my grandmother, when she was working, she worked for a very rich woman, a Datin, who owns Tioman. Actually, Tioman Island belongs to her. I went to Tioman when I was a 14-year-old boy because my grandma brought me there. The driver drove us there, we took her yacht, we went to Tioman, and we saw this big cave and the rumor about this you know, naga, the, you know, this snake that's living inside the cave there. And then we look at the deep blue sea there. It was a beautiful place. But you know, my grandmother, because she was the, the caretaker of this household, only one, one owner, the host herself, and that is her boss. She's the Datin. She has no husband, no children, so she's all alone. She has driver, she has cook, she has gardener, she has so many things. And she always gave us a lot of presents. <clears throat> So after I move out of my grandmother's house, every time my grandma comes to our house, I'm so excited. I look forward to my grandma. Not because of all the goodies that she can give me. Not because of that. But because I love my grandma. She was such a wonderful person who taught me so many values, especially of being, you know, and she teach me things like, after eating, don't fall asleep, you become a snake. So, you know, you know, when I was young, I was so afraid that when I fall asleep, you know, I might become a snake. And don't eat the apple with the seed because an apple tree will grow out of you. So when I accidentally swallow the apple seed, uh, I, yo, I cannot sleep. I keep thinking an apple tree will grow out of me, you know. My grandma taught me all these things and many other things. You know, how to be neat and nice and presentable and always pursue the best. You know, I look forward to my grandma. I can look forward to all the goodies the Ang Pao she gave me. But it's not about that, it's about my grandma. You see, even when she died, I had the honor and the privilege of burying her. Because she was the first person that I had the privilege to bring to Christ. My beloved grandmother. When she died, I told all my friends, I'm so sad because my grandma was like my mother to me. I look forward to her coming. Not because of all the goodies she can give to me. She has given us a lot of goodies, including the house that we used to live. But I want to tell you this. It is her. So when I think about this passage, it's not difficult for me to understand. You know, we are looking at all these events. When will this be? How will it happen? What signs, you know? But Jesus is talking about one most important thing. His appearance. Do we long for his appearance? Do we look forward to his appearance? Do we love his appearance? And finally, be God's global partners of the surest sign. What is the surest sign of the coming of Jesus Christ? It's not about nation going against nation, kingdom against kingdom, earthquakes and famines and droughts and all kinds of cosmo or cosmic upheavals. Yes, those are signs. But the surest sign is found in Matthew 24, verse 14. For Christians, I hope that this will be the greatest passage of Scripture for you. Because this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all the world as a testimony. And then the end will come. The Bible says the surest sign of the coming of Jesus Christ 
is when the gospel is preached to every tribe, every nation, every people's group. Because whatever the language, God desires that they be part and parcel of His kingdom. So let's be global partners. You know, on Friday, I was sharing the young people, young adults, <clears throat> how as a pastor, I don't want just to do evangelism in my family. I don't want just to do evangelism about my neighborhood, about my classmates, about my army camp boys. I want to reach the world for Jesus Christ. So are you a pastor, pastor or what? You like traveling? It's not about that. I am not interested in the positions of being chairman of the Singapore Baptist Convention or the president of Asia Pacific Baptist Federation. And I've said this again and again. I'm not interested in all those titles. Those titles mean nothing to me. They only mean another thing, which is much more precious to me. That God has blessed me with the opportunity to preach the gospel to people of other nations and tribes. You know, two things I want to bring to you before I close. Recently, the Singapore Baptist Convention, we had a missions conference in International Baptist Church. You know, Pastor Ronnie, their church is a big church, you know. IBC is the largest Baptist church in Singapore. They don't need to be interested in what we, the Singapore Baptist Convention, are doing because they, they don't need us. We need them. But one day I had lunch with him. I said, you know, Rodney, I would like you to participate in God's agenda. Let us unite as, part, as Baptists to finish the work that God has given to us. And I never forget what Ronnie says. You know, Pastor Edwin, we can define a lot of things, but when it comes to mission, we are together. He was so together that he let us use his church sanctuary for the missions conference and he came and sat through the whole two and a half hours conference and at the end he even introduced his mission pastor to us. Because mission is what binds our hearts together. You know, mission is what God desires. I was in Okinawa with my wife recently. The Japanese wanted me to be there. And the Japanese says, you know, we are so secluded in Okinawa, we cannot do much, we can't speak English. I say, excuse me, I can't speak Japanese. They say they can't speak English, I say, I can't speak Japanese. But how come we have such a good relationship? It's not about the language. It's about having the same heartbeat. That's what it is. I said, you know, in my last church, we sent a family to Japan as missionaries. And this time, my associate pastor, he wants to go to Okinawa and be a, be a missionary there. You know, he's preparing himself to be a missionary to Okinawa. Beloved, that's what it's about. Being of the same heartbeat. It's not about the language. It's not about the culture. It's not about the food. It's not about all those festivities and, and all kinds of mannerisms. It's about the heartbeat. The heartbeat with God in His global mission. That is the surest sign of Jesus coming. So today, we are coming to the end of history. When the end comes, there will be no more chance. The door will be shut. But are you following Jesus? Are you believing in Him? Are you serving Jesus? So beloved, let's not just follow Jesus when He's about to come or when I'm about to die. But right now and here, are you following Jesus? Are you loving Him? Are you serving Him? Let's be wise and faithful stewards, faithful servants, because Christ is coming. Let us long for His coming. Let's look forward to His coming. Let's love His coming. Let's pray. Father in heaven, <clears throat> these are difficult words for us to understand. But today we thank you for the spirit of truth who sanctifies us with the truth. And who guides us in the truth because the truth will set us free, free from the shackles that bring us down. That Lord, we do not want to live the nice, comfortable life. Because if we want to live the nice, comfortable life, we will not be preaching the gospel to different nations and people's group. But because we want to be in the center of your will, Lord, we don't care about the nice and comfortable life. 
We just want to live the life that you desire. So today, may we have the same heartbeat as you. Because the surest sign of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is the proclamation of the gospel. Help us to be partners together with you. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.